Right, what is an array? An array can be defined as a container object that holds a fixed number of elements of a single data type. Let's look at an example of an array. The first type of array we'll look at is a one-dimensional array. Depending on the requirement, you can also create multi-dimensional arrays and jagged arrays. The requirement for this example deems the use of a one-dimensional array to be appropriate. In this example, we want to store in memory final yearly grades for a particular student in sequential chronological order. So each value in the array will be an integer value that represents a final grade for each year that the student studied. We'll then write each of the values stored in the array to the console screen. We'll traverse each item in the array using a for loop. Let's create a static method and we'll name it one dimensional array. We'll make this method static because we are going to call this method directly from the static main method. If the method was not static, we would need to instantiate an object and then call the method on the appropriate instantiated object. The static keyword means the method is a member of the class in which it resides and not a member of the object derived from the class in which it resides. The static keyword will be discussed in more detail in an upcoming tutorial. So let's define our one-dimensional array. So each grade in this array will be represented as an integer. So we define the integer array using the int keyword. We then follow the int keyword with empty square brackets. Let's give the array a descriptive name. We'll call the array grades. So we follow the name by the equals assignment operator, then the new keyword, followed by the type of elements that we want to store in this array which is denoted by the int keyword. Now here we need to indicate the length of our array. An array must be defined with a fixed length. You can see that we have not yet specified the length for the array, so the C-sharp compiler is flagging this and underlining the offending code with red squiggly lines. So if we hover our mouse over the red squiggly lines, you can see the error message stating, array creation must have array size or array initializer. So you can initialize the array with values at the same time as defining the array, like this. In effect, by adding values at the same time as defining the array, we have also specified a fixed size of four elements for this array. So what happens if we defined an empty array and then tried to add values to the array like this? This results in a runtime error. The error message states, index was outside the bounds of the array. So when defining an array, you must specify the size of the array either with an explicit value denoting the size of the array or by adding a number of elements to the array at the same time that the array is defined. You can do this by either assigning values within curly brackets and using a comma to delimit the individual elements added to the array or by including a value representing the size of the array within the square brackets as shown in the example, where we have explicitly included the number 4 within the appropriate square brackets to provision for the storage of four elements in this array. So in this example we are declaring that we wish to store four values of type integer in a one-dimensional array named grades. And you can see how each value in the array could represent a final yearly grade for a student. Each index, which starts at zero, can denote a chronological sequence. Year one is represented by the index with a value of zero. Year two is represented by the index with a value of one, and so on. Let's create the code that will write the values in our grades array to the console screen. We'll use a for loop to traverse the integer values stored in the array. This is important to note. We are using zero as the starting index in the array. This means that the highest index of the array will always be one less than the number of elements stored in the array. So in this example, the number of elements stored in the array is four, and the highest index for this array will be three. Let's call the one dimensional array method from the main method and run the code. Great. But we could have written this code better. Let me explain why. You can see that the code to define and populate the grades array 
is tightly coupled with the code that writes the value stored in the grades array to the console screen. If we want to define a greater size for our array and appropriately add more values, we also need to update the code that writes the value stored in the grades array to the console screen. This is why we can refer to the code that defines and populates the grades array and the code that writes the value stored in the grades array to the console screen as tightly coupled. If we change the size of the array and appropriately add more elements to the array, this change would not propagate through to the code that writes the values of the array to the console screen. So as discussed, we can resolve this issue by decoupling the code that defines and populates the one-dimensional array from the code that writes the values stored in the one-dimensional array to the console screen. So to do this, let's create a new method and name it write one-dimensional array to screen. This method will accept one parameter, which can be any one-dimensional array of type integer. Let's then cut the code that outputs the values stored in the one-dimensional array and paste it into our new method. Now we need to refactor this code to make it generic. What this essentially means is that the code will no longer be specific to a particular one-dimensional array. This code can be reused to sequentially write the values stored in any one-dimensional array of any size to the console screen. So to ensure that a one-dimensional array of type integer of any size can be appropriately handled, we can use the length property on the array object to return the length of the array passed to this method. All arrays are derived from the array abstract class. The array abstract class contains a length property that returns the size of the array. We need to subtract one from the value stored in the property because as discussed, the greatest index value of the array will be one less than the number of elements stored in the array. This is because the first index of the array will be zero. If the code attempts to retrieve a value from the array that is one greater than the greatest index of the array, this will result in an index out of range runtime error. Okay, so let's call this method from within the one dimensional array method. Now we can test whether we have successfully decoupled the functionality of defining and populating the values in the array from writing the values of the array to the screen by adding more items to the array. And you can see we did not have to alter the code that writes the values in the array to the console screen after adding more items to the array. The new items added to the array were automatically propagated through to the new method write one dimensional array to screen. Another important point to note about arrays in C Sharp is that they are reference types. As discussed in previous tutorials, a reference type stores a pointer to where the actual data for the reference type is stored, which is a memory location called the heap. This means that when the array is passed from one method to another as a parameter, the same data is referenced in memory. So if the array is changed in the first method, the array data in the second method that references the same array data will also reflect this change. So this is a basic example of code reuse. Code to sequentially write all elements in a one-dimensional array of type integer to the console screen only needs to be written once. This code can be passed any one-dimensional array of type integer as a parameter and it will perform the generic function of writing all the values of the elements stored in the array to the console screen in sequential order. Please find the details of where you can download the code examples demonstrated in this tutorial below in the description. These details can be found under the GitHub code section. If you feel you have gained value from viewing this tutorial, please consider giving it a thumbs up. It will be greatly appreciated. And please subscribe to support the channel. If you are already subscribed, please smash the bell icon to be notified of future content, which will be coming soon. Please feel free to engage with me in the comments section. Thank you.